welcome or welcome back. Um, I'm going to read our little intro text one more time. Apologies if you've heard it before, um, but just so that everyone is on the same page. So welcome to this third annual Humanities Podcast Network Symposium. This year, we're focusing on how local contacts matter for humanities podcasting. While podcasts can seem like a placeless medium, they're local in ways that are obviously subtle. So this year, we're asking how the podcasts we make, teach, and consume connect to places we live. So um, speaking of local contacts, I want to acknowledge the background noise, if that's coming through. I'm not going to apologize for it, but I am in a public place where there is music playing. So. Um, we have four sessions which are approaching the locals in different directions. Three of them have already happened. Those are on podcasting and scholarship, podcasting pedagogies, and the craft of podcasts. Um, and those will be available as YouTube recordings soon if you miss them or want to catch up. Um, say from personal experience, they were all great conversations. So I recommend visiting our YouTube page in the next few days. Um, so each of these sessions is an hour. Um, the session leaders are going to begin the conversation on the topic, and then we'll open it up to all the attendees for the second half of the session. So we encourage you to ask questions and to share your insights and experiences. Um, we also ask you to keep yourself on mute until you're called upon um, and to be respectful of the other participants. So if you don't know about the Humanities Podcast Network already, we are a collective of instructors, scholars, and independent creators dedicated to the transformative impact of audio media and the human voice. We work horizontally to empower people to make and use podcasts, um, just my place, for education and scholarship. You can check out our website to learn more at the Humanities Pod Network. Um, so, yes, I don't need to repeat the thing about the Zoom room staying open, um, but I do want to remind everyone that for the first time this year, we're doing in person meetups in addition to the virtual session of the symposium. So check out our meetup list, which is um, I can post in the chat momentarily. Um, find it on our website or on Eventbrite uh, to see if there's a meetup in your area. Um, I'll say that I will be hosting the Brooklyn meetup in an hour. So if you are in the New York City area, please consider coming to that and uh, chatting with me in person. Uh, one more thing. So today's sessions are going to be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel after the conference. If you don't want to appear in the recording, just keep your audio and video off, and that's all good. So um, if you have questions for us, the session leaders, put them in the chat, either directly or publicly, um, or raise your hand once the Q&A portion of the session begins. Thank you all for attending, and we look forward to hearing your voice. So now I'm going to take off my symposium organizer hat put on my session leader hat because I volunteered to be one of the session leaders. Um, and so this session is about uh, podcasts in the world, communities, industries, and social justice. And the project that I want to talk about as one example of that um, is a podcast project that I've been involved with for several years now called Speaking of Spirituality. Um, and this is a podcast that um, aims to create dialogue between members of white churches in Harlem and um, members of the queer and trans performance community called Ballroom, um, and to craft a conversation, a facilitate a conversation around questions of sacred spaces um, and around spirituality. So. I'm going to try and not go into too many, much detail about all the ways the project evolved um, because we began this before COVID. And um, at, the, at the first stage, our idea was that it would be a location based podcast that we would record conversations inside churches and also um, on the Chelsea Piers, which is where the ballroom community has historically met and gathered and formed and also mourned when members of that community have been murdered. Um, 
And our idea was that then once these podcast episodes are released, listeners are invited to visit these spaces themselves, walk around the church, walk around the pier, um, and listen to this conversation while being physically able to look at the spaces that we are talking about. Now, because of COVID, the idea of walking around a church or letting people into churches at all became impossible for a long time. So we had to rethink that. Um, and what we ended up settling on was rather than it asking people to come to a physical location, instead asking people to go to a place that is sacred to them. And if they are able to, to walk around that space while listening to this conversation, to these episodes, each of which is a conversation walking around a sacred space for that particular guest. So, you know, it's still about, um, you know, local spaces, places that people visit regularly. Um, but now with this idea that listeners anywhere in the world can listen and walk around the space that they themselves are in and choose to be in. Um, and the other thing that that led to was that we felt that we really needed some music to like some original music to put into these episodes because we really wanted to take seriously this idea that it, these episodes are a dialogue with the listener that the listener is not just passively absorbing information and knowledge but that it is a true dialogue and so for that reason we began to collaborate with a uh, sound artist and composer um, called Stone Butler, who is also local to, um, or at least was at the start of this project, living in Harlem um, as the rest of the project team were. And um, he composed this very beautiful ambient music that takes elements from club music, which is relevant to the ballroom community, also takes elements of religious music, um, and also worked into these pieces, um, ambient noise recorded at these sacred spaces, and also kind of the background noise of members of the community sort of having conversations. So for example, um, Stone recorded just the small talk that happened in church after the Sunday service was over. And so through that, he created these beautiful audio collages that on the one hand are moments throughout the episode, or listeners in whatever sacred space they've chosen to be in, to truly take a step back from the conversation, reflect, respond in their mind. But also it is music that is really tied to the spaces that these conversations were happening in and the communities that those spaces um, are sacred to. Um, so yeah, this was very much an experimental project. Um, and there were a lot of technical challenges along the way. I will say the project, the, the episodes have not been published yet. We're hoping to do that in the next month. Um, but yeah, anyway, what part of what I found very exciting about this project from a podcast's perspective is really to be thinking locally, to be thinking about real musical spaces and how a podcast can make us interact with them in new ways. Um, so I'm going to stop there um, and hand over to Shri, who is the other session leader, um, and um, then we will open it up to all of you. Thank you so much, Milan. And uh, hi, everyone. My name is Shrikan Joshi. Um, you can call me Shri. I am from Pune, India. Um, it's about uh, 2 30, 2 40 a.m. here in India, but uh, it, these, these uh, three sessions that I've attended have been incredibly wonderful. So thank you to everyone who uh, led these sessions and uh, uh, parted with their uh, valuable knowledge. I, I learned a lot. I always learn a lot from uh, HPN symposiums. I've been attending them since uh, they began in 2021. Milan and I were just speaking about it. Um, so I, um, I come from a background of radio, uh, commercial radio specifically. I am not from an academic background. I was actually, uh, uh, studying to become an astrophysicist. This was back in the early 2000s, but then radio happened to me. And then I happened to radio. I don't know which one of us, uh, got the worst of it, but I'm guessing radio probably suffered me. 
but anyway so uh <laughs> radio is where i uh, began learning uh, began my audio journey so to speak and that audio journey has brought me into the world of podcasting because uh, radio in india uh, comes from a very uh, different background than uh, radio elsewhere in the world is what i've realized over over the years and i'll speak more about it in a in a little bit but um, uh, yeah uh, podcasting in india uh, is slightly different from the podcasting that i have seen across the world especially uh, podcasting in america which is considered to be the gold standard and pretty much is to a great extent uh, uh, so again i i uh, my thoughts are running a mile a minute and i'm finding it difficult to control all of them so apologies if i sound a little bit rambly um and uh, i'll try and gather all of them in a bit uh what i was trying to say was uh, my podcasting experiments have are quite recent as compared to my experience in radio and my podcasting exper- uh, experiments are essentially from the perspective of uh, uh a trying to experiment with the medium of audio and uh, b trying to understand how the art of podcasting essentially gets influenced by geographies and influenced by time uh this is primarily because as i said podcasting in india is very different from america and that is partly because of the geography of india and partly because of how podcasting evolved in india uh so to explore that i started an experiment called the clock starts now um this year in january and the idea was i give myself a random subject and give myself 7 days to craft an audio story based on that subject now the audio story could have been anything but i found myself increasingly exploring local stories local ideas local people uh talking to uh, a lot of people in and around myself uh, in and around my spaces and getting their stories out so the more i uh, attempted to sharpen my audio production skills which was the original intent for the clock starts now i found myself delving deeper and deeper into the um into the local stories that were somehow appearing in front of me every time i tried to tackle a particular subject and each of these subjects was very honestly uh drawn out of a hat randomly of the internet and i had great fun producing those stories uh but after a while i realized uh, after a while i actually landed a commercial project and since i uh, like i said i basically come from a very commercial perspective uh into the world of audio i had to put that project on a hold but i'm planning to restart the project soon and i'm hoping to uh tackle it with a little more uh, planning and preparation um in one of the sessions um, i don't remember who it was i think uh, actually i i don't remember the name but somebody said have a bank of four episodes before you start and i'm planning to do that in the restart of the clock starts now but uh, that's that's essentially sort of a rambling introduction about me and the stuff that i've been doing so far um uh, milan over to you well i know this is like annoying to do but we had a great conversation before you all arrived um <laughs> and i just feel like everyone here needs to hear a little bit more so like you we were talking about the ways that like the radio industry and podcasting are connected in india yeah. um and also about the sort of um like audio dramas and a narrative podcast yeah. in india um i think both of those as sort of local contacts for what podcasting is and how it works um would be great to to share to my yeah. fellow people absolutely absolutely so um india has a rich history of of oral stories india has a rich history of uh, communicating through uh, stories handed down over generations and that essentially is is visible in the kind of audio that gets created in india uh, when radio began in india we copied the format that uh, america and a lot of the western nations were using we uh, we copied the contemporary hit radio uh, that is used in commercial radio where we play music we talk about the music we talk about things that are happening but one thing that uh, uh, sort of uh, 
was focused on when when radio came to india was the concept of hyper local stories so radio in india began with a clear focus on on the city where it was uh, uh, where it was being broadcasted and um, as a result all of the people who were in early radio in india were focused on making stories that were local to the station local to the city where the station was and um, uh, in a sense we were podcasting locally but with a focus on entertainment rather than education so to speak uh, that tradition uh, incidentally did not carry over to podcasting because podcasting took over the storytelling tradition that india has and a lot of the early podcasts in india focused more on the storytelling aspect of it especially the fiction storytelling aspect of it rather than uh, rather than conveying uh, histories through stories so a lot of the early podcasts in india a lot of the early podcasting platforms in india focused on creating uh, uh, fiction uh, fiction productions uh, elaborate fiction productions where we picked up uh, existing fiction epics we picked up existing fiction stories and then converted them into audio uh, or we created new fiction and converted them into audio even today a lot of the podcasting in india is primarily fiction focused but that is changing with some amount of non fiction podcasting entering slowly into the fray but the non fiction podcasting incidentally has taken over from uh, the early radio of sorts where there's a lot of conversational barstool kind of podcasting the kind that you see uh, a joe rogan do or uh, i i'm sorry to bring in joe rogan here but i'm just giving him an as, a, as an example of the format rather than the content um barstool podcasting is basically conversation conversations uh, in the form of a podcast and um, uh, that seems to be uh, the thing that is being implemented in terms of non fiction podcasting here in india uh, but interestingly the variant here in india consists of video because of a very interesting development that had nothing to do with either audio or radio um and that is the fact that mobile data in india is incredibly cheap india has one of the cheapest mobile data packages across the world we pay like uh let me quickly do uh, the conversion in terms of us dollars we pay uh we pay 10 cents for a gb of data every month and there was a point in time where every indian subscribing to a particular telecom operator got a gb a day free to surf the internet as much as they wanted this ended up killing the uh, local terrestrial fm stations because a lot of people suddenly switched from terrestrial fm to uh, internet based entertainment and uh, gave youtube a huge boost which resulted in a lot of content creators popping up on youtube popping up on tiktok which then got banned people shifted to shorts and reels and stuff like that but essentially this started the trend of uh, um audio content and video content being created on youtube so a lot of uh, podcasting in india uh is on youtube rather than your standard rss formats and uh, spread using apple podcasts or spotify or any one of these networks which is why when they came into india to establish their base they had to focus on a, the um, the tradition of storytelling to cement themselves as a production house as a production entity so to speak so yeah it's been a, a very wild ride uh, in indian podcasting in indian uh, audio as a medium but here we are That's great. So I think on that note, um, let's open it up to everyone here. Do you have one thing you want to add? I actually have a question for you about uh, speaking okay. of spirituality, which I found incredibly interesting. Um, there was uh, uh, 
in in one of the emails that we exchanged you mm-hmm. spoke about uh, uh, using non clean audio where where you used oh. hypersensitive mics yes. and uh, uh, you basically captured all of the noise around it now mm. in podcasting this is a strict no no because you want <laughs> you want the audience you want the listener focused on what what your what your central characters are saying so mm. i have two questions on this one was there a specific motivation for capturing all of that noise and adding it to uh, uh to the to the episodes and two uh how did you deal with the fear that your central characters voices might get um sort of overpowered um Okay, well, yes, that's a, to fill others in. So um, we recorded the audio with different kinds of mics from what you would normally use for podcast recording, right? Like you're recommended to use uh, a certain kind of mic that is like good for picking up one voice very close to it. Um, instead, we were using mics that <laughs> really picked up ambient noise, um, environmental sounds as well as human voices um and so i i think one one way that i would kind of justify this is that um you know we we are making this first and foremost for the communities that we're working with and if you're a member of one of these churches you know they are in harlem they are on busy streets and you're used to hearing like traffic sounds sometimes a siren sometimes like honking when you're in there every sunday so that's part of how i kind of justify it is that like for the communities that know these spaces it actually like these this soundscape even if they're not conscious of it like that is part of the experience of being in that space um and so you know we wanted to capture it for that reason yeah. um and i mean maybe to a little even sentimentally one of the churches that we're working with has um is working hard to be allowed to demolish their own church building which has been landmarked they want to demolish it because keeping that church open is costing them a huge amount of money because it's a very old building it's expensive to maintain they want to demolish it and build a much larger structure with 46 units of affordable housing and one of the leaders of this church said like we don't believe god approves of us spending this money maintaining this building while we could be housing people in the local community nice. all of which is to say that recording that soundscape of that building, which might not be in existence a year from now, felt yeah. like actually an act of preservation that yes. was valuable. So, so that is part of it. Um, and um, I'm now blanking on what the second question you asked was. No, your your answer basically encompassed both of my questions. So absolutely beautifully put. Okay. But uh, I, I guess I, I want to say, partly responding to some of the discussion in the last session, um, where they talked about sort of, you know, natural audio and teen audio, like, I, I understand that, especially when the point is kind of like communicating excessively into a very large audience. Mm-hmm. I really want to defend the value of... Um, creating audio that might not be appealing to listen to for everyone but will mean a lot to a much smaller community yes um, and yeah so that that was my thinking there um, in but, fact you know you can all listen and, and decide what you think yourself no in fact to that uh, to that end uh it would it reminded me of a very interesting project called uh sounds of akron or sounds in akron which was basically a uh, a collection of sounds from the city of Akron, Ohio, I want to say, uh, collected by people of the city and uh, compiled into this wonderful soundscape where every single moment of sound reminds you of something that is precious to you because of that sound, because of the space that it represents. So uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, listening to... uh, speaking of spirituality and you know experiencing Harlem sitting here in India thanks um I think Kim is correcting our pronunciation so is it Akron is that the right way to say it my bad my bad my bad 
I uh, can I can I claim India being from India and being an Indian as an excuse? I'm really sorry. Kim, you're muted. No, it's totally fine. No, no problem. Thanks. Okay, okay Karen, but thank I you think so much. On that note, um, let's open it up to the audience. So, um, you know, respond to things we've said or let us know, you know, podcasts in the world, how you think about that. Um, yes. And especially whether that's local context or whether that's actually um, wanting to be out in the very wide world. Um, so I'm so I'm not sure, Nikam Brody, I'm not sure where your first and last names begin and end, but. <laughs> um, no, you got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question is about uh, like what you were just describing with the sound, different soundscape, um, Mr. Joshi. I really um, love those kinds of like, they're almost like art projects, like installations. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely like something that I think about whenever I want to like make a artistic podcast or like personal project. I'm like, but like my imagination is that big. So like where, like, how do I find the median ground? And part of, part of that tension also has to do with, um, I'm not really sure why I would do a, a solely audio podcast that made sense like spoke with spe spoken speaking words as opposed to like some human language and then a lot of like sound almost like music but like maybe also just like found sound kind of thing versus like a content-based video podcast um and so I wondered if you had any kind of feedback on that like what are the affordances of purely audio spoken word or like conversational or interview-based or storytelling narrative podcast very interesting question and I have a lot of thoughts on it because this is a constant debate in, in the commercial podcasting circles on on um, why you would want an audio only or an audio first podcast over uh, something that is video. Uh, did I get uh, the gist of your question correct before I answer it? All right. So um, one, there is a concept that people in audio uh, frequently speak about called the theater of the mind and uh, I believe it uh, uh, actually I don't remember who said it but uh, the quote goes radio is theater of the mind TV is theater of the mindless it was it was meant as a joke quote but the first part of the quote essentially has stuck uh, with everybody who does radio everybody who lives and breathes radio radio is theater of the mind and um, the the essence of the quote is when you hear audio content, it has the power to transform uh, your existence, your uh, person, uh, your your person into a completely different world that you can construct yourself in your head. Whereas when you do visual content, you are very literally spoon feeding your audience what you want them to see and experience. With radio, you have the power to give them tools to create a world of their own. Um, and the beauty of sound is that it is consumed passively, but at the same time, it creates a very active uh, picture in your head. And I don't know of any other medium that can that ha that holds this power of uh, of of passive consumption but active imagination, which is one of the reasons why I love working with audio. Which is one of the reasons why I go out exploring all kinds of audio that I can find, uh, and not just spoken word. Uh, there is this very beautiful piece by uh, by a producer called Bowen Wang. I uh, I, I don't remember the name of the piece, but it is just so beautiful to experience that it should be an it should be a sound installation. It should be a sound art installation in some place. And uh, I wish I wish I could come to America and experience that installation uh, in person. But uh, I, I'll try and find the link to it and drop it in the chat. But Boen Wang, B-O-E-N-W-A-N-G is the name of the artist. He's a wonderful producer. And uh, that is one of the examples of um, 
Oh, that is one of the examples I give to people when they ask me why I should go audio first. Listen to that piece. You'll just, you'll know. I mean, I would just add that I think the question of affordances is a good way to frame it, right? One of the affordances, affordances of podcasts is you can do whatever you want with your eyes. Um, and so speaking of spirituality is one way of thinking about that, right? Like, we're asking people to do something specific with their eyes, which is to like look around a sacred space for them. Um, but I'm excited about like all the potential of podcasts to actually like activate looking um, while listening to that audio. Um, so yeah, that that's my two cents. Um, but yeah, Nika, do you want to tell us a little bit about your own projects? Like it sounds like you've you've been experimenting with these things too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for all of a sudden you just like gave I like figured out what I was looking for while you were saying that. Yeah, so I I helped I've been listening to podcasts. I took a radio documentary class in college and then I started listening to podcasts a lot. And um in when I was uh in Berlin um prior to 2017, I was like work freelancing it for the startup scene and I helped launch a podcast for this like nonfiction summary app called Blinkist, where they were interviewing authors. So it was like very similar to the kind of stuff I was doing as a blogger, like freelance writer in the US, which was just like helping, helping uh get like, you know, like people with something to sell basically in front of readers, like Ariana Huffington or like the David Allen kind of thing, like very, you know, commercial. Um, but then I went to a doctoral program in the U.S. and left during COVID. And I've just been like able to embrace like more kind of creative projects, like more academically driven. And so one of the things I'm working on is um, I've been like doing journalism and I want to, but it's such a weird market, especially with my background right now. So I want to make a kind of coronavirus uh, video with uh, two people zooming um an interview with each other so it's actually a film but it's based on reporting I'm doing of an artist based in Minneapolis who's who's on commission uh for like a big executive board person and a woman who's in jail as a writer um and who's innocent but she has a life sentence so she, and I'm interviewing both of them so she's ostensibly going to be interviewing him about his commission but he can't really give away any of the answers so he's just going to be talking to her about the crime and they're going to be like played by actors who are my friends. So one is like the artist's assistant and one is like someone I know from Twitter who like went to my college. And I was just thinking as you were talking, like the, uh, that would could be a launch for uh, starting a podcast that's visual in that it's just like Zoom conversations between me and like one person I already have some kind of relationship with potentially or maybe just talking to you for the first time. And it could be that like Zoom conversation could be available visually but then it's also possible to listen to the audio without losing anything from because because it's just conversational without losing anything from the video stuff and it would really just be like almost the sally rooney kind of thing conversations with friends uh but like mm, yeah so like a podcast about about that's like auto fiction driven or auto theory driven as opposed to um situated in like some kind of topic So, um, again, if you have comments, raise your hand, put them in the chat. Um, I see that Bill had a comment um, in the chat about accessibility, both from producing and consuming point of view. I think that was about the question of audio only versus audio and visual. Um, but do you want to add a little bit more to that? I'm not actually sure what the producing side of accessibility, what you mean by that. So Bill, would you like to elaborate? It's easier to make a fictional audio uh, essay because you can focus on the uh, theater of the mind, right? You don't have to have sets and all the other fancy accoutrement that comes with visual narration. Uh, so from that, from, from an economic perspective, it's easier. Like everyone has phones and can do video stuff, but if you want to uh, simulate larger things, right, uh, audio is easier. The focus of it is better. And then also, um, I can listen to a podcast while I am driving. I cannot watch a YouTube video while I'm driving. Um, and then similarly, uh, if I 
did not have my site, it would be impossible for me to fully experience a, a YouTube video. So it is more accessible in that way. That's all. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, the, I mentioned VLC in an earlier chat. The cool thing about VLC is that you can like separate out the audio file from the video file. And, and Zoom actually does this automatically too. So theoretically, if, if one were trying to evade like YouTube video, Spotify, like Apple podcasts, like all of the apps and just host it on a website. So like as unmediated as possible, you could like include the audio stream and the video stream separately. Although that is an, still an accessibility issue because I know that when I listen to podcasts, I wanna get them on the app because if I'm on the go or something, it's not very convenient, but perhaps people who have those kinds of preferences have workarounds. So I know because um, Kim Fox is one of our, you know, regular Humanities Podcast Network members, um, but Kim is based in Cairo, um, and so I wanted to just invite you, Kim, to share another sort of local context. Um, how does podcasting look from where you are also teaching at an American university in Cairo? Um, I just think it would be great to get, you know, a, a broader range of, of um, senses of what podcasting means locally in different parts of the world. Yeah, thanks for asking. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's a little late on my end as well, just uh, about 20 minutes before at midnight. And, and my apology, but I would be remiss to say, um, to not speak about the situation in, in Gaza. Um, it's really impacting me and my students and just so many people. That's a note that I should probably be going to bed. But in Cairo and in Egypt, you know, podcasting is still considered an emerging media platform. People are doing it. They're finding the tools to do it, whether it's doing something like a hobbyist from home, and using whatever equipment you have available to go into a professional studio to produce the podcast. The topics are pretty diverse. Uh, we don't really have data on, you know, is are there more in English or more in Arabic? I would presume there are more in Arabic. There is a platform called, I think, Chartable, and they do track the podcasts in, in Egypt. So you can get an idea of what genres are doing really well. Uh, usually comedy is, is up at the top. Um, and yeah, and I do a podcast event called PodFest Cairo annually, and usually in March, uh, but Ramadan is sneaking up on it. So we're gonna have to make a shift, <laughs> but we're I'm, I'm, I'm on pins and needles because we're about to announce the keynote speaker and it's a big deal. It's a big person. So it's gonna be exciting. But if you have any questions about, you know, I can add anything if you want to know about the, you know, the community here. I guess I would love to know just kind of building on Shree's comment about the sort of the availability of data in India and the way that that's led to like video podcasting being popular, like how does the sort of like the technology, the costs of different kinds of technology and the ways and the places in which people consume podcasts, like what do you notice there? Like how does that look in Egypt? Mm. I mean, I'll tell you what I think I know, again, not from data, just from talking to my students and just from knowing the culture. Uh, it's a big wedding culture here. And with weddings come documentation of weddings. I mean, they have all of the top line equipment to produce an amazing wedding video, which means they have equipment to produce good podcasts. They have all of the, the bells and the whistles. So whenever we want to get new audio equipment, it's not that we can't get it. It usually is the cost and how long is it going to take to get it through customs to get to us. So we we can have some pretty decent uh, audio equipment. And, and we do have a studio in our department. We have other studios around campus, but we have a specific one for radio. And we have another studio where students can go and record just their voice. So that's that perspective. A lot of the influencers who, you know, already do what they do have said, hey, we'll take our podcast, I'm doing air quotes, 
to YouTube. So they are doing that. Okay, we're going to do this video as a podcast kind of thing. That is, is certainly happening here and in the Middle East more, more broadly. Uh, you get a lot of folks who are in Saudi who are very popular. Uh, same thing for the UAE coming out of Dubai, for example. Uh, of course, there are qu quite a few podcasters who are doing well in Africa as a whole. So they might be coming out of Kenya. Um, there's a lot happening in Kenya, actually, in terms of podcasting. So that's another spotlight for, for Africa, for sure. And in South Africa are obviously on another level. They have data in South Africa on who's doing what, right? They've, they've got stuff. So thank you for asking me. I appreciate that. Uh, to add a little bit more about the YouTube uh, point that Kim mentioned, um, the YouTube uh, use of YouTube for podcasting is actually gaining traction, not just in India, but I, I feel across the world. I was reading a research conducted by uh, an agency recently, which mentioned that more and more podcasters are including YouTube uh, as, as, as one of the platforms for podcasting. And um, uh, the reason for that primarily is that the discoverability of content on YouTube is incredibly um, high as compared to the traditional discoverability that podcasting uh, platforms otherwise offer. So there is no way to discover a new podcast uh, unless you scroll through the top charts on say Apple or Spotify or one of the other uh, podcasting apps that you use. But YouTube surfaces content based on your prior history of listening. YouTube has a great recommendation engine, which it has been deploying to great effect. Uh, and a lot of podcasters are finding new audiences through YouTube. But the thing is, YouTube is a walled garden and there is no way to bring your podcast out of YouTube or rather to listen to a podcast on YouTube using a regular traditional podcasting app like an Apple podcast or Spotify or Google podcasts or Antenna pod if you're uh, of the open source uh, preferencing uh, preference variety. Uh, so it's it's a very interesting state that podcasting is in right now where YouTube is trying to create a different walled garden for podcasts, but at the same time, uh, allowing that walled garden to exist would mean uh, a very different notion of pod podcasting in the near future. So I'm curious to hear how uh, podcasters in this forum are looking at YouTube as a platform for podcasting. So yeah, any thoughts about that? Um, or if not, feel free to return to earlier topics. I think one thing that I can say to reinforce some of what you were just saying, Sri, is like this question of kind of discoverability um, and promotion. Um, again, I, I wanted to make a link with um, some of the discussion from the last session that um, thinking about like pre-existing local networks um, that can allow people to discover podcasts. Um, so, I mean, again, thinking from personal experience, right, like churches uh, they have a built-in community that they already know how to communicate with very effectively. Um, and I think, you know, there's a temptation with podcasting and with, I guess, any kind of media, like, to think, okay, more, bigger, broader audience is always better. Um, and, you know, putting things on YouTube is, is one part of that. But I wonder also about the value of, uh, you know, whether other people discover it or not, really focusing on like local networks, institutions that already have built-in communication networks. Um, 
And even to the point, so one thing that we are planning to do with this project is to have a private episode, which is not going to be available to anyone except the participants, um, because we felt after some of these conversations that we recorded that they were really wonderful, but also very personal in ways that um, we weren't sure if people would want being public. And also, you know, anyway, so, you know, that's the sort of extreme limit of like no promotion, not even available, not discoverable. It's only for the people that participated. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would love to hear other people think about maybe you know, promoting things at the local level and um, what some of the value of um, things not reaching a broader geographical audience might be. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, a bit of that question was motivated because of my um, my my origins in commercial audio and commercial radio. But when you spoke about uh, uh, disseminating only to a local audience, I was reminded of this wonderful uh group called in the dark radio which operates in london um by uh, it's run by two people one is one of them is called nina i forgot her last name but the other one is talia augustidis and they hold these beautiful audio exhibitions uh, very frequently where uh, they curate interesting bits of audio and play them in 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 a local space like uh, like a local pub or uh, maybe a church or maybe um, a community hall and uh, they hold these listening exhibitions for people which again speaks to your idea of uh, a private podcast episode of sorts and i i do wish that uh, more of these events happen and i do wish that uh, some of the sessions happening locally today will play probably an audio episode of their choice for people in, in those spaces to hear. I just hope. Great. So, I mean, I, I can see there are people in the room who haven't had a chance to speak yet. I think especially if you have a project um, that you know, in some way has gone out into the world. I mean, what podcast is not private? Um, or if you've been working with students who are thinking about podcasts moving into the world, um, I want to invite anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak yet um, just to share a bit about what you've been working on, because I think partly it's just the variety of projects and approaches that is so exciting and inspiring. So, yes, yeah, open to, to anyone who has let us know what you're working on. Hi, um, I, I'm working on a project in Ann Arbor, Michigan, an ongoing project with students um, called Collecting Stories. It's, it's a small, like one credit class right now. Um, but uh, the purpose was to have students engage in um, like close listening with people that, and there are two different experiments. One that was with people they didn't know, sort of interviewing them, but then the one that seems to be most um, interesting right now to the students as well is uh, people that they're close to and having um, close conversations or or some something that they care about. And it's the experience created between the two people who are having the conversation is the, the moment we're trying to capture. Um, so it's an ongoing project, um, but I am a lecturer. I am not tenured faculty. And so I have an ongoing struggle <laughs> with trying to, I haven't been able to lift this project. Um, I've got now and built like an archive um, that now has seen one university um, data hosting source change um, to another one. And so links that had been built have been lost. So I, I feel like um, I, with podcasting, if anyone has um, an idea for an ongoing a uh, hosting source for materials, um, or even if you think this is a project, because it's called Collecting Stories, it's all Michigan students that are doing the work. They're short pieces. Um, 
between three and five minutes. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I feel like this could be an important archival project. And meanwhile, students are learning the the medium and actually saying things like, oh, I I never knew that, like almost listening, learning to listen again, because maybe we lose that a little bit um, since, I don't know, in the last few years. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> I, my immediate thought is, um, I don't know if you've spoken with librarians at your institution, um, but I was actually at a workshop yesterday that was about um, pamphlet making as a student activity, um, sort of learning book history through pamphlet making. And um, the uh, leader of that workshop was saying that the students in her classes make books and make pamphlets, and then they can choose to have them be archived in the university's like rare books library, which the university librarians are very excited about. Um, and then for the students also, it's very meaningful and they've actually like taken their family members to come and like see this book in the archive that they made. And that's just sort of, I, I don't know quite how that would work with audio, but I think there might be something there. Thank you. Thanks very much. This is just a random thought, and I'm not really sure how it would work in the US, but have you considered approaching a local public radio station and asking them if they might be interested in uh, sort of because you said they are about uh, four to six minute pieces and four minute pieces are essentially the staple of public radio in uh, uh, in a lot of the uh, stations that I've heard. Have you considered submitting them or trying to sort of strike a um, relationship with them for hosting the audio or broadcasting the audio? Thank you for saying that. Um, not really, because in some ways, a concern of mine was it's the project is a lot like um, StoryCorps, which is which is um, on because that's one of our like sources that we study and use as a text um, and as a model. So I was I don't I don't know, but maybe because it's local, there might be an interest. I do work. I do work at the student radio station, the student run, uh, you know, college radio station. Mm -hmm. And so. I have thought of maybe I could air them on the radio station there. And you saying that encourages me to like, just, just do it <laughs> um, maybe, or try it, you know, cause yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, uh, coming from the world of radio, uh, I have always thought of radio as a hyperlocal medium and uh, anything that is locally produced. My first thought is give it to radio because uh I do understand that the consumption has sort of consumption patterns have changed over the recent years, but uh, hyper local content always always meshes well with local radio, and I would I would strongly urge that you consider it as as a potential hosting partner, collaborating partner of some sorts. Thank you. I'll try. Thanks. So I can see that there is at least one watch party here um, being hosted by John. And I don't know if it's technically feasible, but would any of you like to um, share anything, any reactions to the conversation so far? John's watch party is missing his rooster. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was half hoping to see the rooster in action. I think the rooster might be outside <laughs> or possibly elsewhere. Um, oh, he clarified it was not a rooster, it's a chicken. Oh, it's chi it's a Apologies. bantam chicken, I remember. Yeah, yes. it's a bantam. It's una gallina, una gallina, no un gallo. I, okay, have, that was <laughs> I have no that idea was, what that, that okay. was. Spanish. That was a little Spanish. Angel, would you like to share any thoughts and reactions to the conversation so far? Oh, no, that was some some great information that, um, how do you pronounce her name? She was talking about her students. And that, yeah, that um, I agree. Um, and when I did my podcasting class, that, that I realized that I wasn't listening a lot. And when I started listening and listening to the podcast, it immediately started to 
as I'm listening, several things were happening. One is that it moves your meter. That's like the number one thing. Once it moves your meter, sky's the limit. That's how I, it's like you fall in love with yourself and then you're really listening. When they do timestamps, we're really listening to the story structure. We're like, oh, wow, that's the opening. Oh, that's the setup. Oh, there's a turn coming. There's a turn coming. And so for me, I was just super excited. I was walking around like, and I have a background like, um, she, she ranked. Did I say that right? I have a background in radio also where I, I interned for about 90 days and then I landed on a on a gig that I worked for about a year and a half and I was like director of special projects, but that was just a title. I was just really an underwriter. I'm good at communicating. I know I can just walk up to people and be like, hi, my name is Angel. You mind if I ask you a few questions? And people are like, sure, let's talk. Next thing you know, it's three hours down the line. So I'm really good at that. So I managed to bridge. Um, I worked for um, an NPR affiliate on campus in Florida, WFIT. So I got a lot of experience, but then I got sick. I caught sciatica from the hotness and walking. So I stepped away from that and um, decided to do my MFA. And in my MFA, I did a podcasting class. And it just, again, like I said, it just it moves you in a way that's different and it helps you in communicating and it helps your writing and um, sky's the limit. I, I also wanted to mention something in the conversation that they were talking about. I believe it was Nika Moveri. I don't know how to pronounce that, but you're going to have to help me, Nika. And um, yeah, I find that YouTube is toilet tissue for someone who did. I was labeled urban journalist during my undergrad at CCNY. Because, um, and I find that YouTube is just toilet tissue, but I like what, um, was it Milan? Milan said that you can narrow it down to who you're, the people that you wanted to see who originally was watching you. And I didn't know you could do that on YouTube, but I also find that the attention span is so short now in terms of the videos that they're putting out because of this TikTok stuff, you know, or whatever it's called. So it's hard to keep them engaged if you're doing like an, a podcast and you're using audio and you're using um, also video. So I just wanted to add that I, I'm kind of, even in my presentations, I'm working on a presentation now for a series and I've been pitching it with audio and I've been getting responses from EPs and it's all audio, no video. I'm still working on it. I haven't landed on anything. Still broke as a joke. I'm still searching, but I'm not giving up. And that's what it's all about. All right. Well, it is one minute before a lot of people's happy hours are starting, including the one right here in Brooklyn. Um, so I'm going to head off to host that. Um, I hope all of you are heading on to wonderful things the rest of your day, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Um, and so thank you to all of the session leaders today. Um, and thank you to everyone on the Humanities Podcast Network who has helped make this possible. Um, and yeah, let's continue the conversation. You know, we have this big event once a year, but um, the network is doing things all year round. So, um, you know, there'll be a follow-up email. And if you feel inspired to do anything, to take action as a result of any of these conversations, then, um, you know, we're here to support that and connect people.